This is the Tyler Morgan Show on Relentless Daring Media Network. Welcome back to the land of bourbon and bad decisions. This is the Tyler Morgan Show live on twitch.tv slash Tyler Morgan Show. Or check it out on YouTube. I've been saying for a long time, eventually there will be a YouTube link that's easy to memorize. So if you're listening to this on podcast and you want to see this ugly mug, go to youtube.com slash at the Tyler Morgan Show. Yeah, I know, at the Tyler Morgan Show. Or just go to YouTube and search for The Tyler Morgan Show. Either way, you will find it. So, before I get into all that is worth getting into, let's talk about some coffee. Not that I'm getting paid to talk about coffee, because I would never do anything that would jeopardize, you know, getting paid or getting paid by ACAS and being allowed to do ads with them. So I will gladly tell you all about American Pride Roasters. For free, without any expectation of compensation from uh, the wonderful people up there, from Dave and Faith Matthews. But anyways, American Pride Roaster is some of the best coffee I've ever had. Um... I mean, I was going to go on a spiel about the uh, one of the veterans they talk about. But we'll talk about one of the ultimate veterans, George Washington. Yes, there is a George Washington blend. And again, and there's also another veteran, Teddy Roosevelt. There's are so many good blends there. And I came and begin to get into the... To, all of them they have, especially honoring the veterans that they have chosen to honor, whether they're presidents, whether they're some random old guy who just, you know, I still can't believe that he, the guy who talked talk about last week on that blend, he was, uh, again, 80 years old when he enlisted in the Civil War. Uh, but, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, oh my goodness, he led a group of mercenaries after he was out of the army. Yes, that's right. When uh, when Teddy Roosevelt led the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill and these historic battles in Cuba, he had already left the military service where he had you know commanded so many great just historic units, including the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, which... I served in Fort Hood. So, again, the history that goes in, that there is represented by these different blends of coffee is absolutely amazing. Again, like I said, Teddy Roosevelt, a man who was so ready to serve his country that even when out of the service, he put together a group of mercenaries known as the Rough Riders who went in and fought on behalf of the United States in Cuba. So, I mean, so much that we have to honor our veterans for that you always feel like you're being left out of the fight, and sometimes you think there is more to give. So, what better way than to honor a man so dedicated to his country that he would go fight in a war that he didn't have to. So again, thank you again. And also the Tate Roosevelt is one of my favorite blends, period. And a big thanks to American Pride Roasters and Dave Matthews who seek to honor great Americans and especially the, uh, you know, those presidents who literally put their lives on the line for this country. So, if you want to go check it out, uh, go to AmericanPrideRoasters.com or APRCoffee.com. Either way, it takes you there. And check out the blends of coffee they have. Small batch roasted and to order and ground to order. So if you want whole beans, guess what? You can get whole bean coffee and grind it yourself. Have an espresso machine? Guess what? You can get an espresso grind ready to go. 
American Pride Roasters, historically great coffee. All right, so getting into the craziness of everything. Yes, craziness. Um, I really have to start off with everything that's been going on in the world of pushing abortion. Since the overturning of Roe vs. Wade earlier this summer, this election cycle has been marked and had just been completely driven for the left on abortion. Uh, at this point, abortion isn't just a medical procedure. Abortion has become a sacrament to the left. Um, that's all you hear about. Abortion this, abortion that. They're going to take your right to abortion. Oh, my God. Which, first of all, you never had a right to kill another human being. Period. End of story. I'm sorry. You just didn't. But the fact of the matter is that not only have they doubled down, they've tripled, quadrupled, in some case, even quintupled down. And it's getting to the point now where the left is engaging in tactics that really have to make you wonder what is their end game besides just the ability to kill your babies. The, uh, for instance, uh, NPR this week, national public radio, you know, funded by taxpayers and from generous donations from listeners like you. Um, they had a journalist, I use that word loosely, went to an abortion clinic. I, I forgot where it was. I think in Detroit. And was following around and recording women who she was meeting there. Uh, one woman was there getting checked in because I found out I'm pregnant. I'm a single mom. I've already got two kids. I just can't physically, mentally, or financially take care of another. And then I think was the absolute worst part is she went into a room with a patient who said she could be there. Doctor says she could be in the room, all this stuff. <laughs> and she recorded the abortion process. And the way she talked about it, though, it wasn't like, you know, sterile. And, okay, let me re rephrase this. Make sure I use the proper terminology. I'm not saying it was not sterile as in, yeah, this place is nasty. I mean, it didn't seem like it was a... Uh, You go in, you're expecting a medical medical procedure, air quotes. And the lights dim, soft music playing, oh my gosh. And then they give them a sedative to kind of, you know, relax them because it's, it's just so off, such, such a great thing they're doing for themselves. I mean, for them, yeah, I guess that's all I can say is for themselves. And then you hear it come on. The vacuum aspirator. Yes, that's right. They turn on the shop vac that hooks to the cannula that goes into places. And then 
sucks the baby out of the womb. Now, I know it seems a little harsh, seems a little rhetorical, seems like some uh, decidedly pointed comments. That's because I believe the baby is a baby from the point of conception. You see, and the whole idea, and then, like I said, this whole idea that, oh, well, you, go and you check out the pregnancy tissue. Uh, excuse me, pregnancy tissue? Uh, by pregnancy tissue, you mean the fetus, the baby? Because really, the only pregnancy tissues that are involved in a pregnancy would be the placenta. It would be any of the uh, the lining inside the uterus that helps feed the baby. It helps make that uh, mesh between the baby and the mom. So, you know, that that whole exchange happens for nutrients and oxygen without killing the baby because sometimes mommies and babies have two different blood types with two different RH factors. And you combine, you get, you know, the wrong blood type that doesn't get along with other blood types, the wrong RH factor, you know, transferred across the baby there. And it can have some very, very, uh, deadly effects on the unborn child. So those are pregnancy tissues. But to say they sucked the pregnancy tissue out is just, uh, it is so disheartening that that's where we're at in America. That you can look at this procedure and go, oh, well, nah, nah, that's just fine. Here's where it gets crazy still. In 2019, three years ago, a little movie came out called Unplanned. It was about Abby Johnson, who was well-renowned within the Planned Parenthood circle. You know, employee of the year for the entire Planned Parenthood for a couple years in a row. I mean, she was on her A game. When they made the movie about her, they decided they were going to depict an act, well, do a very, very lifelike depiction of an abortion. When we, they decided that when we do this thing, we're going to make it look and sound as real as possible. That way, people are really hit with it. That movie received an R rating because of a medically accurate depiction of an abortion. But NPR, again, National Public Radio, with funding from all of our tax dollars, went in to an abortion clinic, recorded interviews, and recorded and aired the sounds of an abortion. And it's not like you see on TV where, wow, we're just going to to relax and we're going to put this uh, this thing up here and it will be done, just a matter of seconds. Pardon me. You hear this vacuum aspirator come on, which is loud as heck, And then once the uh, cannula is inserted through the cervix, well, it turns out the uterus does not like to be invaded by a cannula. And so this poor woman is having these cramps and I can't do it. I can't do it. And there's someone there the entire time comforting her. Oh, you're doing the right thing. You know you are. It's okay. We're almost done. We're almost done.
This was aired on NPR. They're proud of it, that they're using the tax money that you and I paid to Uncle Sugar to go into the rooms with these women having these abortions and then to play the sounds of it and to talk it up. Oh, well, the, once you get into the abortion room, you're met with a doctor who has purple hair, so she looks young and approachable and friendly. And the lights are dim, the soft music is playing in the background, and, oh, it's just like having a baby. It's like it's like a birthing suite at the hospital. Blech. No. And it's getting to the point now where pop culture is just embracing this and running with it. The last couple of weeks, my wife and I, we, we like Grey's Anatomy. We think it's a well-written show. It's not always necessarily 100% accurate for medical stuff, which is fine. They're allowed a little uh, you know, artistic license. But the first episode of the new season, you have one of the doctors who's like, oh, I got my black scrubs in for the uh, you know, OB department because of the attack on women's rights. The next week, they're doing some very uh, comprehensive uh, sex ed videos. And uh, McDreamy's ex-wife is there. And she's ranting and raving. And so is Dr. Bailey about, Dude, the women are losing their rights. And all these young girls are going to get pregnant and not be able to get an abortion. I'm just like, oh, my God. Do we not know how the Dobbs ruling went? There's not a federal ban on abortion. It is a state-by-state issue, as it should have been from the beginning. Although, personally, I think from the beginning it should be non-existent because, again, you're ending a human life and not just, well, I just removing the pregnancy tissue. And they keep pushing this agate prop for whatever. And you got to keep in mind, with Grey's Anatomy, which Grey's Anatomy has always kind of pushed the boundaries on stuff because obviously Shonda Rhimes has a political bent. And so she's going to use that platform to get her bent across. But the way that the agate prop just keep push, they keep pushing it over and over and over again. You know, uh, when you know McDreamy's ex-wife is dealing with a teenage girl who found out she's pregnant. Uh, one of the doctors is advising her on the abortifacient drugs. As you when you take this pill, <clears throat> when you take this pill, it's going to stop the pregnancy from growing. Um, I'm sorry, what? And then when you take these two pills, when you take these pills, yeah, you're gonna be like like bad cramps and blah 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 blah. Okay. Shonda, I don't know if you've realized this. When you're pushing all your agate property, you're in Washington. When you're in Washington, you can invite the satanic temple to come in and do a satanic ritual over the remains of your aborted baby. Because Seattle doesn't care. Washington, because of the crazy people who have overwhelmed your state government, they don't care about you know, saving babies. They care about killing them. Which I find it crazy that Shonda Rhimes is pushing this narrative, seeing as how the majority of babies who are born in this or who are aborted in this country are African American babies. Yeah. She's pushing for a procedure that kills more black people 
from this is from a black woman. Yeah, you gotta stop the patriarchy, man. Yeah, down with the system. Okay, well, perhaps you should allow your population to grow and not be killing all of them off. You can't say that, man. We always built to raise a baby on a single income. I don't know. Have you tried doing things the old-fashioned way, like getting married, then having a child? But better yet, when you get married, make sure that you're financially sound. You're both working. If one of you is in college, you're yeah, about done. Whatever the case may be, you set yourself up to be able to take care of your family in the future. Don't just go sleeping around. Don't just go making a whore of yourself just because you bow at the altar of self-pleasure. We are living in, though, depending on what side of the political aisle you are, you're on. If you're on the left, you are living Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, where the greatest distraction you have is promiscuity and sex with whoever. And just like things are now, if you engage in monogamy, you have people going, wait, wait, monogamy? You, you don't have any more partners? It's just that person? Oh, my God, we, we have got to get you laid by someone other than her. Of course, I could barely fin- barely get into the book because the amount of uh, eugenics that goes on is insanity. They have select breeders that, and then everyone else who is not that cream of the crop, you know, in vitro, because babies aren't born the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way in uh, Brave New World is viewed as gross. Disgusting. Ugh. Well, like I said, it Brave New World centers around uh your you know typical futuristic dystopia where the population is controlled by the government, but whereas you know nineteen eighty four used fear. Fear of the government because they're spying on you all the time. Unless you're unless you're a prole. And you're a member of the proletariat. If you're a member of the party, oh yeah, you're in trouble. But if you're a prole, oh my gosh, you have this weird sense of freedom because you don't have to worry about the government because they just don't care about you. You're too small. But you know, Brave New World is this whole idea that now you can, you know, you have states that are pushing laws that allow you to have an abortion for any reason. Huh. That sounds kind of brave new world. You, your bait, you do a genetic test and your baby might have the BRCA1 gene. You're like, oh my God, I don't want my kid to grow up and have breast cancer. Abortion! <gasps> my child has down syndrome abortion i i i really want a boy i i don't i don't have well, i can't have a girl abortion abortion is the solution not to issues of oh dear god my child is forming with only a rudimentary brain stem and upon birth, we'll have maybe a few hours before he or she dies. Abortion is not about parents having to weigh that heavy decision. Abortion, the abortion advocates, really, they don't care about the woman who was raped and is now pregnant. The woman who was, or the teenager who was sexually abused by a family member who is now pregnant. They don't care about that stuff because the fact of the matter is the majority of their money comes from, I just want an abortion. 
abortions for selfish reasons, my job, my career, my college, whatever the case may be. Oh, my standing in my hometown is so small, so I had to come here to the big city to get this abortion. The abortion advocates don't care for you. They don't. They don't care about your hard decisions. They just want to be able to kill babies. That's it. Oh, pardon me. I had a a chili dinner at church. Uh, had a big chili cook-off in our fall fest. And my couple chili dogs and the bowl of chili I had, they might be talking back just a little bit. It's a little rough. But now you have um, in Canada, this is a, a TikTok video I shared. I'll, if I remember, I'll try to get the link in the show notes. But in Canada, in Quebec, you have, they're looking at expanding euthanasia to newborns and infants and toddlers. When I saw this story, the first thing that popped into my mind was, oh, my God, this is the T4 project all over again. Uh, will you have, I mean, are you going to have doctors loading full truckloads of people into the back of an ambulance, squeeze as many people in there as possible, and then uh, start it up with a tube running from the exhaust into the truck like the T4 project did, or exhaust being funneled into a whole room and just letting them die of carbon monoxide poisoning? God, I hope not. And then now I've heard something uh, earlier today that they're going to open up euthanasia. They were saving for people you know who are suicidal, people who were terminal. You know, they they meet a very rigid structure they have to go through to be able to say, "Hey, doc, can you kill me?" I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, doc, can you? Assist me in committing suicide. To the point where they're expanding it to even possibly homeless people. Excuse me, sir. I see that you are unhoused. Guessing by the tracks on your arm and the scratching at your chest, you have a heroin issue. Perhaps if you would like to stop being a drain on society and its resources, you can come with me. And we, <clears throat> you can come with me, and we will end all of that permanently, if you would like. Again, that is so very T4 Project, because not only did they kill babies, they killed the elderly and the infirm, those who um, consumed more potatoes then they produced the useless eaters. That's how all they're viewed as. If you go back to a Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger, Margaret Sanger invented Planned Parenthood to keep black people from reproducing. I know it may seem like rhetorical flourish, but She is on the record calling African Americans and Jews, quote, human weeds, end quote. And she advocated for plucking said weeds from the general population. Abortion has never been about women's rights. It's never been about, you know, it's ne- just never been about any of the stuff they say it's about. It's not women's health care. It's not reproductive health. And I'd go as far as say that abortion is reproductive unhealth, to be honest. Because, again, health care doesn't result in the death, in the willing death of another person.
I want to talk to you about Keto Chow. Keto Chow is a small company out of Utah that uses the absolute best ingredients to make the absolute best weight loss products available on the market. Their first goal is flavor. Who wants to drink something as a meal replacer that tastes like crap? Keto Chow understands that this is a hard barrier for a lot of companies to break through, so they have some of the best flavors. Cookies and cream, chocolate, vanilla, real strawberry. These are the best shakes I've ever had. I've been using them for a few months now, and they are amazing. So go to the link in the show notes, check it out. You can search for recipes on how you can use their Keto Chow products to make amazing foods that taste amazing and help with your weight loss goals. KetoChow.xyz, Keto Made Easy. Drizzly is the leading home alcohol delivery service available. Imagine being able to sit at home and pull up your smartphone and browse your favorite wine, beer, spirits, and then have it delivered to your home in as little as one hour. Go to drizzly.com or check out the link in the show notes and start shopping today. Not available in all areas. Please drink responsibly. Drizzly.com. You know, it helps if I turn my microphone back on before I start yakking again. All right, so let's let's, let's talk some Joe Biden. We've got the election coming up here on Tuesday, just a couple short days away until Election Day coming into the uh, midterms. And I think the left is finally starting to uh, show their hand a little bit on uh, what their plans for Joe Biden is. What their plans for Joe Biden are. Ugh. My bad. I had been never... Oh, I'm sorry. That was ableist. That was... I'm, ah! Where's my where's my cat of nine tails? This is so flagellate. It's beat my back till it's bloody and raw the so joe biden i mean it came out today that uh joe manchin tweeted that (laughs) joe biden is divorced from reality great yeah joe manchin trying to come trying to come in look like the good guy to uh some somebody somewhere as Joe Manchin proved, Joe Manchin will be on your side until he's not. Whatever he can use to leverage the uh, his fellow Democrats into crafting things a certain way to meet what he wants done. And we saw this with the uh, inflation, I think it was Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I, basically a couple pieces of legislation Joe Manson held out, held out, held out, so they wouldn't be able to have a majority. And then finally they 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 hit the right notes and started getting Joe Manson uh, got his attention, and he flip-flopped and he voted for their giant spending package. Well, aside from him uh being Joe Manson, like I said, he called out Joe Biden. He's divorced from reality, which the rise has been saying this for a while now. Well, now I'm starting to see a little bit more in the way of what is the game plan. Uh, this is from wealthofgeeks.com. So I've never heard of it. Take it with a grain of salt. It could be accurate it, or it could just be playing into my confirmation bias. I don't know. Uh, headline, amid concerns for Biden's mental health, the 25th Amendment may be invoked soon. Now, uh, one of my friends, whom I shall tell you about what he's got coming up later on, uh, before the end of the podcast, because I'd like you to be part of it. 
he has he has uh, stated that he believes if Joe Biden is going to be removed from office by the 25th Amendment, it will probably occur sometime after January 20th. That way they can get almost two full years out of a new Kamala Harris administration plus an attempt to let her run and be president for the next eight years following the uh, next couple election cycles. And at the time I thought it was okay, it's kind of crazy, but now I'm actually seeing, you know, from the left, they're like, uh, yeah, he's got to go. All right, so it may be coming time for the country to fully address a very polarizing topic, President Biden's mental health. The conversation about the president's mental health actually started when Trump was in office. Yes, it did. I see you were paying attention, Ms. Claire Conway. After his inauguration in 2017, Donald Trump was faced with claims that he was not fit to be president due to his mental health issues. In January 2018, he asked his doctor to administer a cognitive test to put the topic to rest. I did really good. I named the animals a cat, a bear, an elephant, a donkey, or a horse. Uh, it, my, I'm tired. My Biden is coming off as uh, Ron Reagan. It, so, please forgive me. On top of the mental health concerns, people were also attempting to have him removed from Congress or removed from office based on these concerns. Members of Congress asked the Congressional Research Center to provide an overview of the 25th Amendment and its history and purpose. Another motive for requesting this information was to understand the process for removing a president from office. In December 2019, 350 psychiatrists and mental health professionals signed a petition claiming that Trump's mental health was, quote, rapidly deteriorating, end quote. The accusations and claims picked up momentum after the 2020 election and the January 6th incident. Of course they did. A group of Democrats attempted to create a presidential disability review body in 2017 to help with the impeachment process, but they ultimately failed. We have frequently seen Biden seemingly wander off after a speech without knowing where he was going and needing someone to direct him. He sometimes seems confused when giving speeches as well and loses his train of thought. Kind of like me, after being up for like 15 hours, and I just said, oh, I see you waiting for Yeah. We won't talk about that episode. That was a bad episode. Do, 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 do. Congress proposed the 25th Amendment in 1965, and it was ratified by the states in 1967. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6 of the Constitution says that the vice president will assume powers and duties of the presidency in the event the president's inability to serve. The article, however, does not precisely define what inability means. Because you'll see this um, after the attempt on Ronald Reagan while he was in the hospital uh, convalescing, George H.W. Bush essentially assumed the power of the president. As was to be expected. Every time the president goes under for a procedure, whether it's a colonoscopy or, you know, you name it, the vice president is moved to a secure location and is administered an oath of office to so that way he can preside over things in his boss's purview. Uh, after the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963, Congress made the conditions and process for transferring power more specific, hence the 25th Amendment. The amendment is comprised of four sections. First section re restates the vice president becomes president upon the death or resignation of the president. The second section explains who will take over for the vice president when they step into the presidency. 
The third section details how the president can voluntarily transfer power to the vice president. The fourth section is the only section that has never had to be implemented. It provides for the involuntary replacement of the president when the, quote, vice president and a majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments or of such other body as Congress may be, may by law provide, decide that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties in, of his office. Now, the article says uh, it seems unlikely at this time, Vice President Harris would take such a step. But again, the fact that they're starting to broach this subject really makes you wonder, they have something in the works that maybe the uh, the powers that be are trying to find a way to make it happen. Th- that's what it says to me. And that maybe Vice President Harris is just biding her time until she gets to where she needs to be to try to go for a full 10 years as is constitutionally allowed. And like I said, we've got Joe Manchin who's calling out Biden being divorced from reality. We had this article from Wealth of Geeks saying, well, we might want to look at that. Um, how can we how can we get ahead of this? That's how it seems to me. But we shall wait and see after the midterms what happens with a possible twenty fifth amendmenting of Joe Biden. Now. Time to go into the realm of crazy conspiracies, and we're going to talk the uh, Pelosi attack. Now, I have stated from the get-go that while there are a lot of questions, many of them that will not be answered, that cannot be answered, that the government's going to hide, in these gaps, it, it's, it's like Mad Libs. They have given us two or three paragraphs on what happened, and it's got blank lines all through it. (laughs) Pardon me. And then we, the American people, have to go through and fill in those lines. And so people start coming up all the crazy stuff. You know, 2 a.m. naked hammer gate. Gay hammer fighting. Okay. Who was this third person in the uh, in the house who opened the door? All this just keeps leaving so many questions that the, a normal human, whether they are a conspiracy theorist or not, will start filling in the Mad Lib blanks with random noun here, crazy adverb over there, and... Yeah, it seems like a fun verb here. So, we start, you know, like I said, you get gay hammer fighting. And I have said that from the beginning, this seems to me, based off reading his own history, he was a depressed person. He was, you know, he had detached from reality and is living inside of a delusion. He's psychotic. And I, I say that not as pejorative. I say it's the most uh, accurate way to describe him. He is a person in a state of psychosis. And the more and more he travels down crazy conspiracy uh, rabbit holes because, hey, man, the government's out to get me. And this, this article right here, it, it proves it. It, it, it confirms it confirms what I already believe. It, it turns into a, a seeking out confirmation bias is what I'm trying to say. So every time they get a little piece of the uh, confirmation that their crazy conspiracy is true, oh my gosh, there's right there. 
Um, so it just it becomes an ongoing cycle. They find more stuff that confirms their that confirms their their beliefs that they're trying to find, so on and so forth, to the point where you have a dangerous, paranoid, delusional. Who decides that I'm going to go find Nancy? I'm going to ask all these questions. And if she doesn't, I'm going to break her kneecaps. Again, that's, that is what, that is what uh, mental health professionals call disorganized thought. It's not that he is crazy. It's not that he is criminally insane. It's just that he is not sane. I think to Pape, who has a long history of drugs and alcohol and, you know, other psychotic behaviors, just kind of, I said he fell down the rabbit hole and he hit the bottom. He decided out of the blue, I'm going to go check Nancy. Because it, it's, it's not well thought out. And it's, I said, all these other stories are coming from the house. It just Right now, I'm going to stick with the, you know, I don't have the exact quote from Sherlock Holmes in discussing Occam's Razor. But once you remove all the imp- you know, once you remove all the impossible, no matter how improbable it is, you're left with the most likely answer. Or, you know, strip away, strip away all the stuff that you, that you don't know, all the stuff you know is wrong, inaccurate, and just get down to the facts. It's usually the most simple explanation. And so I don't need there to be some crazy government conspiracy that, oh, the guard, the the people in Washington, D.C. who are supposed to be watching monitors were playing on their computer. I don't need that. I don't need the San Francisco police were in on it. I don't need all the crazy because... The whole idea that the uh, Capitol Police in Washington, D.C., they monitor the security camera footage for the Pelosi home because Nancy is the Speaker of the House. It's kind of important. Monitor the security of her house, but they can't do everything all the time. And so they missed the feed where a guy shows up and then he breaks the glass in the kit, kitchen or dining room, wherever it was, and then goes into the home. Well, there was if there was a security sensor on the door, it didn't go off. Is the pape just a walking Faraday cage that anytime he gets around equipment, it, ma- it malfunctions? I don't think so. Not one bit in the least. I think it's just a crazy story, period. And the only simple answer, the only good answer, is that basically a crazy person almost killed another politician. Just like the crazy person who thought Jodie Foster would love him if he killed Ronald Reagan. He is just another... uh, Another crazy person and failed assassin. But on top of that, he is also an illegal alien. And apparently, you can be a violent illegal alien in the United States and not be deported. Unless the person you tried assaulting was the uh, husband of the sitting Speaker of the House. 
So this is coming out of CNBC. So again, take it with a grain of salt. Accused Paul Pelosi attacker David DePape could be deported after release from custody, DHS says. Oh, they're actually going to try to get rid, try to deport him. Hopefully after he gets done with a lengthy jail sentence. Uh, the man accused of breaking the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's house and attacking her husband with a hammer could be deported from the U.S. after he's released from custody, DHS said Thursday. U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement, or ICE, lodged an immigration detainer on 42-year-old Canadian national David DePate, and DHS told CNBC in a statement. Uh, the detainer requests that the San Francisco County Jail notify ICE before DePape is done, serving time so that immigration officers can take custody of him. ICE places immigration detainers on arrested individuals who it believes can it can deport under the Immigration and Nationality Act. Uh, record show that DePape entered the U.S. through San Isidro, California, point of entry on the southern border in 2008 as a temporary visitor classified with a B-2 visa. Canadian visitors who enter the U.S. for business or pleasure are generally only admitted for six months. In his first court appearance Tuesday, he pleaded not guilty to numerous charges, including attempted murder. He is currently being held without bail, and his next hearing is set for Friday, his public defender says. And it's... That's insane that we can have illegal aliens who are in this country for almost 20 years. But because you know, they kept their nose clean, never had so much of the parking ticket, whatever. It just, we can let these people who are like that just think they're running all of us. <laughs> Kim says he's the only illegal alien the Dems wants to deport. Yeah, you have illegal aliens all over the country committing horrible, horrible crimes. And, oh, wow, you know. But the minute that it truly, like, bites them in the backside to be able to, uh, you know, when it comes to one of their people being attacked, they flip on a dime. It's absolutely crazy how fast now that, you know, Oh, God, he's an illegal alien from Canada who entered the United States through Mexico. That's not suspicious at all. It's like everybody uses Mexico to get here. But, I don't know. If he, if, if, if he's actually deported, hopefully that uh is after his very, very lengthy prison sentence. All right, that's going to wrap it up for the show this week. Again, thank you so very much to everyone who was jumping in on the live chat and all that. Thank you to everyone who is watching at youtube.com slash at the Tyler Morgan Show. Again, link will be in bio. And thank you to all of the podcast listeners. Um, pardon me. If you would like to get involved with something that is very near and dear to my heart. Again, I was talking about the sacrifices veterans make. Um, my buddy Keith Malinak at The Blaze next Friday will be hosting will be hosting a live stream event from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at his channel, youtube.com slash at the mic with Keith where he is going to have guys from, uh, uh, it used to be called uh, 22 Kill, uh, I forget the new name of it, and uh, he's going to have Chad Robichaud of the Mighty Oaks Foundation there 
raising money to help our veterans. So it's a great thing. Uh, tune in, check it out. You know, help veterans. Uh, the whole 22 a day. Some say that's an overestimate. Some say it's an underestimate. I say, why are we letting our veterans die? They fought for us. Why aren't we fighting for them? And that's exactly what Chad Robichaud does with the Mighty Oaks. That is what, uh, I think it's called One Tribe. I think it's what it is. One Tribe. That's because we are. Regardless of what MOS you had, whether you were a combat role, whether you were a support role, whether you were an, in the Navy, the Air Force, yeah, maybe Coasties, Marine Corps, which uh, if I don't get to say it, if I don't get to say it, happy birthday, Marines. Yeah, hopefully this is an early birthday. Hopefully I didn't miss it. Um, this next round of crowns is on me. God bless you guys. Whether you're in the Army, if you fought for this country, you are part of a tribe. You are part of a family. And these guys love you with all of their hearts, and they want to do everything they can to make sure that you are here for your family whether it's your fellow veterans, whether it's for your wife, your kids, your husband, your mom and dad, these guys want you to be here. Veteran suicide is is so upsetting. And that Keith is wanting to come out and do this show to raise money to take care of them, please, please, please go check it out. It is mean the world to me. I mean, I'm wearing my... Wagons for Warriors shirt while I'm doing this. That's my da- that's my dad's charity that he does to help veterans in my local area. So, like I said, I support this stuff. Asking you to check it out. Such a great, great event. So, next Friday, November the 11th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And also, just a uh, quick reminder, I will not be doing a live show next week. I will be in Dallas for the uh, for a special, for a Glenn Beck special that I get to be part of the audience in. So that's awesome. Hopefully I have lots of pictures. You know, be able to put up on uh, Twitter, whether it at uh, RD Media Pods or <clears throat> at Fake Tower Morgan on Twitter. The Facebook page, Tyler Morgan Show there. All the good places. So if you're listening to this on podcast, I'm going to try to wrap this up really quick. Um, listen to this on podcast. Remember, whatever platform you use, if you are able to rate and review, please, number one, subscribe. Also go to YouTube. Again, youtube.com slash at the Tyler when I say at, I mean the little little at sign. Uh, kind of on Twitter, at the Tyler Morgan Show. Go there, subscribe, hit the bell. Hit the dadgum bell so you get notifications. It'll go ding whenever I post the episode on YouTube. So, but, you know, on your regular podcast, hit the subscribe button. Then number two, yeah, number two, pfft. Rate it five stars, five stars. I know tonight's like a three star show. I apologize. It's been a really long day, but I apologize. But you know, five stars, all except four, three and below. We need to have a talk. After that, please write a review. Tell people why you like the show. That helps the algorithms find more people to check out the show, and it just helps grow this family. Finally, the fourth thing I ask, please share this episode with someone who you think will like it, send it with someone who you think will hate it. I don't care. Just please share the show. That way you say, hey, here's a guy who has the exact same frustrations as you. Check it out. You know, who knows? 
maybe when you send it to someone who you think will hate the show, maybe they're just needing someone expressing the things that they feel but maybe have a different opinion on. And they're just like, oh, check this out because maybe maybe we're just not on the same just not on the same page here. So oh, it, it's it's always good to be able to reach out across the aisle when you can. So like I said, share this with someone who you think will hate the show. And I will greatly appreciate it. So again, thank you so very much for listening, whether it was live, whether it's on demand. It means the world to me. And as always, stay relentless. The Tyler Morgan Show is a relentless, daring media production. The Tyler Morgan Show is supported by its listeners. To support the show, go to ko-fi.com slash Tyler Morgan Show to donate there or relentlessdaring.com and hit the donate button at the top of the page to set up your donation. All music used in the Tyler Morgan Show is used with permission from purpleplanet.com. Link in the show notes. 2 Timothy 1.7